Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Barry Colfer, and I'm the Director of Search here at the Institute of International and European Affairs in Dublin. I'm pleased to welcome you to this webinar on the future of France, the 2022 French presidential election. We're really delighted to be joined by two leading experts in this topic and friends of the Institute, Lara Marlowe, Paris correspondent at the Irish Times, and Emmanuel Sean Quinlevin, lecturer in European politics at UCC who've both been generous enough to take time out of their schedules to discuss the important forthcoming French presidential elections. Momentarily, Lara and Emmanuel will speak for approximately 10 minutes each, and then we will go to questions and answers with you, the audience. You will be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, as usual, which you should see on your screen. Please feel free to send any questions in throughout the session as they occur to you, and we'll get through as many of them as possible once our speakers have concluded their opening remarks. A reminder that today's presentation and Q&A are both on the record. Please also feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. I'll now formally introduce our speakers and we'll then hand the floor over first to Lara and then to Emmanuel before the Q&A. Lara Marlowe is a Paris-based foreign correspondent for the Irish Times. As a journalist for more than three decades, working for Time Magazine and the Irish Times, Lara has lived in Paris, the Middle East, and Washington, D.C. She's a recipient of the Légion d'Honneur and has written three books, including her most recent, Love in, in a Time of War with Apollo Press. Many of you, of course, will also have been following uh, Lara's incredible coverage of the atrocious conflicts in Ukraine over recent weeks. Dr. Manuel Sean Quinlevin is a lecturer in European politics at the Department of Government at UCC, University College Cork where she teaches French politics, comparative politics, and European policymaking. Dr. Sean Quinlevin also holds a chair in active European citizenship and is the director of UCC's hub in active European engagement. Manuel holds a PhD from UCD, my alma mater, and between 2017 and 2019, she led a Jean Monnet project entitled My Big Friendly Guide to the European Union, co-funded by the European Commission, Communicating Europe Initiative uh, with DFA and Cork, uh, City Council. Thank you both very much for being with us. I'm looking forward to the discussion and Lara, the floor is yours. Thank you, Barry. Um, hello, everybody. I'm still, despite the whole pandemic, I'm still not used to just seeing myself on the screen and, and, and talking to a computer, but um, it's it does enable us to do this today. Um, this election has been really an election foretold for ages, for months, maybe for a year. Um, <clears throat> we, we are expecting a repeat of more or less what happened in 2017, which was um, Emmanuel Macron and Marine Le Pen being the two finalists qualifying next Sunday night uh, for the runoff. And then everyone, every, mo most people expect Macron to uh, defeat Le Pen again, albeit by a much narrower margin this time. She's actually progressed uh, a, a great deal in her process of de-diabolisation, de, de or undemonizing herself, I suppose we would say. Um, she has a lot of people even question whether or not she's, she's really right wing now, which is, is quite shocking in a lot of ways. Um, it has been a hard five years for Emmanuel Macron. He had three huge crises, the Gilets Jaunes revolt in 2018 and 19, the pandemic for the last two years, and now the war in Ukraine. Uh, in fact, one of, the, um, one of his, his advantages in the election is that he is seen by 64%, according to a poll of French people, to be capable of handling a grave crisis. Um, and he's, he's seen as having l'étoffe d'un président, the, the stuff, the making of a, of a president, whereas uh, Marine Le Pen scores only 39% on that, that same criterion. Um, Marine Le Pen's greatest challenge, and perhaps more recently her greatest blessing, has, has come from Eric Zemmour, uh, who emerged suddenly at the end of last summer as um, a, a challenger to her. And they were equal in the polls. I think they were both at 15, 16%. Uh, 
uh, for a while. And he has plummeted in the last, since the war started in Ukraine, because he said that Putin was justified in doing what he did. He said that Ukraine had always been part of Russia. They spoke the same language until the 13th century. He didn't explain about the last eight centuries what, what that meant. He said that Ukrainian refugees were migrants like anybody else. Uh, and so his, his, he has now fallen to 9% um, in the a poll published yesterday. And he was, remember, he was up at sort of 16%. But he still is a, is a reserve of votes for Marine Le Pen. Um, if she gets the 22% predicted plus, uh, you know, uh, Zamora's 9%, that puts her already over a third of the vote without counting all the people from Les Républicains, from the, the mainstream conservative party who might vote for her over Macron. Um, so the other, the other surprises, um, I mean, there, there is a surprise in the last week, actually the la over the last three weeks, Le Pen has narrowed the gap between her and Macron quite dramatically. Uh, she was at, um, I think it was 17, let's see, she, well, there was a 13 point, uh, percentage points difference between them in mid-March. Macron was at 30% and she was at 17%. And now that, that point difference is only six instead of 13. So she definitely has momentum and that's worrying a lot of people. Um, although the, the main poll published by Les Echos yesterday predicts that Macron would win 53% of the vote uh, um, and 47% for, um, for Le Pen, uh, there are a few polls that actually show Le Pen winning. So I don't need to tell you that would be an absolute um, seismic, you know, huge e event for France, for Europe. It would be, it would be pretty dramatic if, if that happened. Um, the other thing that happened, a smaller surprise, which, which seems to possibly be receding, is that um, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, uh, who, from the far left, uh, La France Insoumise, France Unbowed, is now uh, firmly in third place. So he, he's moved way up in the polls. And um, although he, he, he fell one percentage point, um, strangely enough, a certain number of his voters would probably go to Le Pen on the far right. Uh, so he's another reserve for her. Uh, another, um, I remember um, Patty Smith, who may be listening to us today, who was my foreign editor at the Irish Times, used to quote um, some British prime minister saying, events, dear boy, events. and and. Certainly, we've had surprises in past campaigns. You remember the scandal that um, did for Francois Fillon five years ago. Um, there have been a couple of things that have come up, news events, not on that scale, but they, they could both hurt Macron. One is the McKinsey scandal, the McKinsey Consulting Group, a uh, big American uh, firm, which you remember, um, uh, the governor of the European Central Bank um, worked for in, in Chicago. Anyway, McKinsey, it turns out Macron's government has commissioned a billion euros worth of studies from McKinsey consultants. And uh, this is very unpopular. Um, France, as you know, has a huge civil service and people say, well, they should have been using civil servants. Uh, Macron's people point out that this is far less than um, the consultants reports commissioned in Germany. And they say it was high, most of it, three quarters of it was high tech stuff like um, the TUS anti-COVID um, uh, app on the telephones and, and so on. Uh, but that's, that's one, a lot of people are very angry about that. I'm personally not thrilled to have my tax Euros going to pay McKinsey consultants. Um, but anyway, that, that's been a big scandal and the opposition is, is trying to make a big deal of it. Uh, more recently, um, a disabled Jewish boy called Jeremy Cohen uh, was pursued by some, I believe, Arab youths uh, in somewhere near Paris and he was run over by a tram and died. And the police initially said it was an accident. People are screaming, this is a cover up. Uh, that it was called an accident. Um, and it, it brings to mind uh, at Eric Zemmour's big rally at the Place du Trocadéro, uh, there were people chanting Macron assassin, Macron murderer. And they were alluding to accusations made by Zemmour um, who held Macron responsible for the murder of two old Jewish women 
in eastern Paris by Arab neighbors. Um, so it, it, it's very ugly and obviously it's, it's not Macron's fault and he did not um, kill these people. But that's that's part of the, the ambiance of, of this election is that the far right is accusing Macron of not having been tough enough on security and immigrants and Arabs and Islam. Um, very quickly, if if uh, what is the difference, you know, between Macron, Le Pen, um, Macron again is portraying the difference as a battle between progressives on his side and nationalist populist on Marine Le Pen's side. Um, Macron actually got two things quite wrong uh, in foreign policy, although that's his, probably his strongest suit. One is he thought that one could deal with Vladimir Putin, that one could befriend him, one should have dialogue with, with Putin. In fact, he's still talking to, to Putin um, on the phone or on by video link uh, very often. And he also uh, was very gung-ho, very keen on promoting European defense as something independent from NATO. And the war in Ukraine has shown that to have been kind of mis misguided as well, because NATO comes out of it very, very much reinforced. Um, but nobody, I haven't heard anyone in France reproaching him for the, those things. Um, he, I, I think he's done, he's dealt with the economy quite well. One, another one of his boasts is that um, unemployment is only 7.4%. He says it's the lowest it's been in 15 years. That's disputed by his opponents, but it, it certainly is, is much better than it was. Um, I wonder, though, he, he's telling the French they will have to work longer and harder, um, which is never a terribly popular proposition, and he wants to raise the retirement age from 62 to 65. Um, I fear that may lose him a few votes as well. Uh, and he also, the, part of Macron's problem is he's en même temps. He always, you know, on the one hand, on the other hand, at the same time. It's very hard to read a kind of vision or continuity in what he's saying. And I'll give you one example of that. He's saying that people who get the RSA, the, the uh, Revenu de Solidarité, um, what is it? So anyway, they, it's the basic welfare play, payment, but they will have to do 15 or 20 hours a week of training or activity. Um, and at the same time, en même temps, he's offering a prix Macron, a bonus, uh, to workers of up to 6,000 euro a year. Um, it's the employers who have to pay it, but it's free of tax and free of social charges. Um, I would say his other uh, shortcoming is he's just terribly long-winded. He took four hours uh, to present his program and um, his, his rally, his one big rally, his speech was two hours and 10 minutes. And I think he just loses people's attention. I mean, Vladimir Putin actually said probably the only funny remark he ever said was that, that uh, Macron had tortured him with his verbosity. Um, Marine Le Pen, and, and I'm, I think I'm running over time, so I'll try to speed up a little bit here, um, has done a very good campaign by just about everyone's evaluation. She has managed to portray herself as very close to the people. And the fact that virtually everyone in France refers to her simply as Marine, uh, and they don't refer to Macron as Emmanuel, shows that she does have, she does seem to have the common touch. Uh, she's made a, a, she's talked a lot about purchasing power, uh, which polls show is the number one concern of the French. And her way of dealing with that is to reduce VAT on energy from 20% to 5.5%. Um, she's also, some people who, who question whether she's far right say, well, she, she supports, she supported same-sex marriage, um, she supports the welfare state, and she wants retirement at age 60 rather than 65, which, um, you know, it's, it's like Christmas for everybody. But her two, I think she still can be qualified as extreme right because her, the two pillars of her campaign are anti-immigration and anti-Islam. Uh, for example, she wants to ban the wearing of the Islamic headscarf everywhere, everywhere in public in France, which is which is a pretty severe measure. Uh, she wants to block welfare payments for the parents of delinquent minors. Uh, she wants to actually change the French constitution to establish what she calls the, the national priority. In other words, jobs, public housing, hospital beds, um, every benefit will go first to French people. And all after all the French people have been served, then we'll see about the foreigners. 
Uh, and she also wants to renegotiate um, European text and treaties. Um, analysts say that her election, even though she no longer says she wants to leave the EU, it would in effect be a, a Frexit. Um, it, would, it would mean France virtually leaving um, the EU. So I'll hand it over to Emmanuel now. Thanks a million, Lara. And, and indeed, I was really curious there about the notion of Frexit, and I, I hope Emmanuel may, may comment on that. But just before Emmanuel, if I might just uh, intrude for a moment, because so much of what Lara said there is of, of enormous interest, and we'll get onto it in the questions and answers. I'm just really curious about one thing, Lara. Was it, you said from Les Eco, a recent poll was 47% of people are uh, indicating support for, for Marine Le Pen. No, this is um, what they do. I mean, France has this crazy system of two or two round presidential election. I, I believe that the only people in the world who do it this way. Uh, so it's what they call the, the report, report des voix. It's who will you vote? Well, actually in Ireland, there's there's a you, you there's something kind of similar where your, your vote I, I've never understood it. I won't go into the Irish system. Uh, but the, the pollsters, what they do is, okay, for the first round, we, we know the, the, the panoply, the range. For the second round, because mm -hmm. we're not certain it will be Macron-Le Pen, uh, the pollsters ask people, if it's mm -hmm. Macron-Le Pen in the second round, in the runoff, who would you vote for in the runoff? And the result of this poll, which was done by Opinion Way KR partners for Les Echo, was that Macron would get 53% and Le Pen would get 47%. And I'd, a simple question that would, I'm sure, draw a complicated answer. But if you have, a, have anything simple to say on the, the composition of that group, Lara, compared to five years ago, because so much has changed since the last presidential election, we obviously well, had... Uh, five years ago, Macron won 66% of the vote in the runoff, and, and Le Pen got but 40, no, 34. Uh, yes, 34%. So it was 34, 66. Uh, so it, th this shows you how dramatically the gap has narrowed. Uh, and is, is there any sense of, of what the composition of that has been? Like who, what sort? Oh, socially, of, you mean? Socially, in terms of identity profile of any kind, what sort of people are being more drawn to, to, to Marine Le Pen now than five years ago, if you can comment. Um, well, I mean, overall, city dwellers vote for Macron. The more educated you are, the richer you are, the more likely you are to vote for Macron. The poorer you are, the more rural you are, the more likely you are to vote for um, Le Pen. But she is in lot, younger people prefer Le Pen as well. Older people prefer Macron. Um, and I, I think it would just be a strengthening of those trends or tendencies is, is my, my feeling for it. Um, I think Le Pen has probably gained a lot from the mainstream right. Uh, there's a certain kind of, uh, well, actually it was Zamora was, was getting people like uh, C.O.T., who's um, a deputy from Les Républicains, had actually said he would rather vote for Zemmour than for, um, for Macron. And certainly there will be people on the right who would, who would vote for, for Le Pen. Um, lo, lo, the opposition are saying, don't vote for Pécresse. Valérie Pécresse, who's the official candidate of Les Républicains, is tied with Zemmour now at 9%. And people are saying, don't vote for Pécresse. A vote for Pécresse is a, is a vote for Macron. She, Macre, um, Macres, <laughs> Pécresse and Macron are the same thing. In fact, at one point, Pécresse accused Macron of having stolen from her, her um, program. But now he's kind of he's kind of veering right, I'm sorry, he's veering left at, 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 in the last few days of the campaign at his big rally. He said he um, channeled François Mitterrand. He talked about la force tranquille. And he, he's talking now about a lot of social measures and, and education and childhood and gender parity and, and these sorts of things. Thank you so much. And Emmanuel, thank you for indulging me there just with, with that question. Hand over to you, Emmanuel. You, you have 10 minutes. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me, first of all. Um, and yes, just to follow from uh, what Lara said, I'd like to have a look at Europe as a structuring theme of the 2022 campaign. So unlike in 2017, when actually 
um, Europe was um, was really present in everybody's program and um, everybody's manifesto. It's not really there in 2022. And you, Lara alluded to it, but several candidates have actually changed their position on the European Union. So you had Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who had a plan A and a plan B and a plan B regarding leaving the European Union in 2017. In 2022, he's not uh, on this line, he's changed, um, and he's talking about disobedience. Lara mentioned Marine Le Pen's position, who was advocating because she was advised by Filippo uh, leaving the Eurozone, that actually scared a lot of her voters. So she rode back on this. And as Lara mentioned, um, and it's interesting that Lara thinks it's a Brexit, She's obviously not presenting it like this because she doesn't want to scare away voters. So if, if there's anything about um, Europe that candidates have probably learned is that they shouldn't indicate any type of Frexit or any type of leaving the European um, Union or the Eurozone. But what Le Pen puts in her manifesto is uh, staying in the European Union without following the rules. And she clearly states it, we will not follow the EU rules. Um, so that's that's quite interesting. Um, even when you look at Emmanuel Macron, who in his 2017 uh, manifesto had 43 mentions of Europe or European, when you look at the 2022 manifesto, there are only 18 mentions uh, of, of, of the same uh, Europe or European. Um, Macron's uh, candidacy was, uh, official candidacy was um, delayed. Uh, so there were lots of rumors on the structuring of his manifesto. Um, and there were rumors that you'd have four packs, a general generation pact, a production pact, a Republican pact, and that the fourth one would be European pact. But actually, it came out with only three pacts. So Europe is weaved into the program. Uh, certainly, Macron hasn't lost his European credentials. But when you look at his manifesto, it's all about a very protecting France. And it's much more about France at the forefront than actually Europe. So, um, so that's quite interesting. Uh, looking at, um, you know, if you had to color code the 12 different uh, candidates, there are only really three that are pro-European, uh, you know, that are openly supporting um, the European Union as it is, or towards further integration, and that's Anne Hidalgo. Uh, Yannick Jadot is the only one who has several pages on Europe about a European environmental treaty, and he specifically mentions a federal Europe, uh, and he's the only candidate to do this. And obviously, Emmanuel Macron, uh, I, I, I would categorize as um, pro-European, obviously. Um, interestingly, Europe uh, burst onto the uh, campaign scene because France took the presidency of the Council of the European Union and 1st of January, the, the government across France decided to, um, to hang the, um, the European um, flag in different kind of key landmarks. And one of them was under the Arc de Triomphe, where the Soldat Inconnu uh, lies, and um, that created a huge controversy. Um, Le Pen, in particular, went all the way to Le Conseil d'État, our highest administrative court, to ask for the flag to come down, that it was a disgrace that the French flag had been displaced, when actually the French flag doesn't fly permanently under the Arc de Triomphe. Um, so that was uh, the, the, the first kind of, uh, obviously, um, controversy and mention of, uh, of Europe uh, in the campaign. Um, interestingly, the flag was taken down two days later simply because, um, you know, that was the timing of it. It was just a signal that France was taking the presidency uh, of the council. And then it was um, put up again on the 10th of March when there was this um, council meeting in Versailles and actually um, it didn't trigger any comment then. Um, so that's uh, that's how um, you know Europe was was put into the candidacy, or, uh, into the campaign. Obviously, um, you know the Macron's candidacy was um, delayed, and Lara uh, mentioned that uh, the war in Ukraine played a huge part. Uh, you had several candidates and um, consultants or 
advisors who argued that the war in Ukraine has robbed the presidential campaign. Um, the outgoing president, Sou Macron, postponed until the 3rd of March um, to declare that he was uh, a candidate. And it has left the existing candidates in this kind of ambiguous situation where they have, they want to they feel they need to show national and European unity, but at the, at the same time, the French presidential campaign is one of the, our most political and politicized moment of, uh, of our republic. So necessarily, it, they, they have felt kind of um, in between to uh, pulled um, and, and, and found this campaign really uneasy. Um, certainly, the candidates that have experience have also been the most favored by the electorate. So we have Macron, Le Pen and uh, Mélenchon, who have the experience of campaigning, who have kind of the stature. Um, and uh, it's no surprise that they're uh, the top three uh, in the polls. Um, and the other aspect that I'd like to mention is that France has a large proportion of pro-Putin or anti-NATO politicians compared with the rest of Europe. Uh, so um, the war in Ukraine, the relations with Russia, the relations with Putin, two different things, um, have been really at the center of, um, of, of uh, the, the campaign. Um, I just want to um, maybe mention uh, a couple of things still. Um, so. In my mind, the European Union has been omnipresent um, due to uh, the COVID crisis and the war in Ukraine. We had obviously the, the, the vaccines. Um, we had the next generation EU program that uh, was um, you know, discussed. Uh, we had the, grand, the green transition through the European Green Deal and just very recently the bulk gas uh, purchases as well. So putting really the European Union at the heart of our daily lives. Um, and uh, but at the same time, um, you know, um, it's it will be interesting to see what uh, how the 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 election uh, actually uh, goes uh, because we have just had Orban being re-elected um, and creating uh, a lot of um, hesitancy or or um, or trouble uh, within the the European partners. Obviously, Le Pen um, was one of the first one to congratulate uh, Orban. Um, Orban straight away criticizing Zelensky. And, um, and showing his support towards Putin. So here, this European unity will be uh, in trouble uh, pretty quickly. Um, and Macron um, is um, putting on the agenda, the um, auditioning of uh, Hungary um, regarding Article 7, potential sanctions. So this is something that the French presidency is uh, going to try uh, and push. Um, at the same time, um, um, there, so the, the rule of law uh, issues will be will be quite uh, at the heart of the campaign, but also what's coming after. Um, and regarding what it means for Ireland, this particular e election, I think if it is Macron who wins, um, it will be more of the same. Uh, you know, he's still pushing for uh, the minimum corporate tax, which has been um, kind of uh, put on hold uh, just there by, by a vote um, of, of several countries, uh, Poland, Sweden, Estonia and Malta. But certainly Le Maire wants to put it back on the agenda in April and there will be a constant push. This has been an agenda for a long time. This is um, certainly, it has the momentum and it's certainly going to happen. But uh, Macron will push for further, further reforms of the Economic Monetary Union and a push on European defence. And what Lara mentioned is very interesting because France has always had this idea uh, this idea that you know there would be a European defence independent of NATO, and I think Gérard Arrault, who's a former uh, French ambassador to the US, is has always said to we have to be pragmatic like we have to build a european defense pillar within nato and i think the war in ukraine has uh, again highlighted to france that the partners will not build if there is a push for european defense by them it will be within nato um and i think france ha ha is coming 
down to this compromise slowly but surely but it will be nonetheless uh, a push on European defense. What I want to finish on is the fact that whether it's Macron or whether it's Le Pen, in my opinion, the, the, the main election isn't this one. The main election is the legislative election because for either of them it's going to be difficult to have a majority in the National Assembly. Uh, Macron has got very well en marche or la reine has got very shallow roots uh, uh, across France, but Le Front National, just the same, we've seen it in regional elections, they, they didn't manage to get a region, um, and I can't see Marine Le Pen getting a, uh, an overall majority, so it's either a coalition government, which is always problematic, or it is a cohabitation, and I wouldn't rule out a cohabitation, which means that in case of a cohabitation, neither Macron nor Le Pen will actually be the, the the real deciders, you know, at, at European level, like it's the prime minister for a lot of uh, the, the the decisions that will represent France in um, in the in councils and etc. So um, I would say it's it, of course it would be as Lara mentioned a seismic change and a seismic uh, vote if my Le Pen was president. Um, and, and it would, you know, signal, um, you know, um, issues regarding, um, you know, European values and etc. But um, let's keep in mind the, the next election, which works in tandem with the presidential election and will have an impact on Europe and as well for Ireland then. Thank you so much, Manuel. I'll, I'll turn to Lara in a moment, Lara, just if you have any, any immediate comments before going to the questions and answers. Um, but Manuel, just something you were saying there, this, am I right to say there is the, is it the biggest, one of the biggest gaps between the presidential, the second round of the presidential and the legislatives? Um, specifically on that, is, is, are there any specific implications about the, the length of time you could comment on? And also, I, I don't know the extent to which there's truth in this, but I had read possibility of, of, of Mr. Sarkozy re-emerging as a player in advance of the legislatives. Is there any truth in that or is that just parlor talk? Okay, that's several points. So yes, it is the biggest gap ever in time between the two elections since we moved to the Klaikina. Um, and um, there are certainly, um, uh, well, they, they were taught, there were rumors that Macron was even thinking about in, uh, dissolving the National Assembly to bring those elections earlier. Now, this is usually seen as a gimmick by uh, by the electorate. So it's it can backfire quite badly. Um, and, you know, uh, Jacques Chirac could tell a lot to Emmanuel Macron about uh, using the dissolution uh, for for your own purposes. So um, so that's something uh, that has disappeared. So I think Emmanuel Macron has probably uh, pushed it uh, back. Um, yes, there will be, you know, Zemmour, for example, is preparing for the legislative elections. Like he, he's now, I mean, he knows he won't be in the second round. What he's looking at is the reconfiguration of the mm -hmm. right here and stealing as many uh, Les Républicains voters as possible um, and, and quite trying to reconfigure then uh, a, a, a right that uh, is much more conservative and is eating up um, Marine Le Pen's uh, electorate because there's a real question mark whether Marine Le Pen will go for a fourth if she's not elected this time, a fourth candidacy. So, um, so they, there's uh, this, this, the, these two months are will be quite crucial, yeah, in terms of uh, deciding what's going to happen next. Extremely interesting, both of you. It's, a, it's such a pleasure to, to to hear your reflections, and we have a, a huge amount of questions. And obviously, but I did say, Lara, just in case, is there anything that you'd like to respond to, to what Emmanuel said, or should I carry on with the questions? The only thing I would comment. I mean, I agreed with ninety nine percent of what Emmanuel said. I I'm not sure that the legislature legislative elections are that important for the simple reason that the French president is, is virtually a monarch and he does what he wants to. And, and we've seen it under Macron's rule, um, the, his, his own majority, which I think is, may no longer be a majority because some people left it, it was, it was pretty borderline anyway. Uh, they were constantly complaining, the president doesn't pay any attention to us. He never invites us to the 80s, he doesn't talk to us. Um, he pretty much ignored his own majority. 
And um, okay, they need the, the legislature to pass laws, but the president can actually govern more or less by decree if he wants to. Uh, Macron has done a certain amount by decree. And I, I think that regardless of the, the results, um, Les Républicains will be a sort of reservoir for either Macron or Le Pen. Uh, I, I was at a think tank conference the other day here in Paris and the uh, Dominique Regnier, who's an expert on the, the French right, was saying that he expects if, if Le Pen does is in the runoff, uh, a certain number of the, the, the far, the further right Les Républicains, people like Ciotti, Vauquier, may come out and actually support Le Pen and say, well, you know, it's the best thing for the country, or if she wins anyway, they will. And, and I could very well imagine her having a, a prime minister from Les Républicains. And remember, uh, Macron has had two prime ministers from Les Républicains, both of his prime ministers. Uh, so I, I think, yes, it might be a form of cohabitation. And if so, in either case, it would be with Les Républicains. Uh, but, she's, but Emmanuel is right that uh, the extreme right always does poorly in, in um, legislative elections. Uh, the system is rigged that way. In fact, uh, Macron promised on Saturday he would, he would look at that so that, that representation was more fair, that, that he, would, mm -hmm. he would reform that system. Uh, but uh, uh, Mitterrand had changed it to favor the Front National in the old days, and then it was changed back. Uh, but the extreme right, the, the extremes do very poorly. And uh, Les Républicains, it's kind of ironic, Valérie Pécresse will probably not do very well, but I would expect them to do much better in the legislative elections because they're very rooted in, in the territory, in the, on the ground, um, out in the provinces, whatever. They, they basically own the Senate uh, and they usually do quite well in, in the National Assembly as well. Everyone loves the French election. It's so exciting. There is a, a, a huge amount of questions, so I'm going to try and get into as many of them as possible. The first one I'm going to put, first of all, to Lara and then Manuel. It comes from your colleague, Patrick Smith, foreign policy editor at the Irish Times. Patrick asks, are voters concerned by Le Pen dissembling over support for Putin? Lara, then Manuel. They should be, uh, but they don't seem to be. Um, she, as you know, she got a loan from Putin, well, from a, a Russian bank close to the Kremlin. Uh, in the last election, she owes them, I think, 9.4 million euro. Uh, she went and made a speech in the Duma. She's very chummy with the speaker of the, of the Russian, you know, Duma. Um, they no, they. I haven't heard anybody questioning this, and I think it goes back to the old Gaullist thing of French independence. And you know, they, De Gaulle used to talk about superpower condominium, and and they so they saw the Soviet Union and the U.S. as almost equal evils in 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 a way, and that that mentality is sort of rooted in 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 France, and and I think especially the far right. Uh, would be very distrustful of the US and of NATO um, and, and less suspicious of, of Russia, astonishingly, even after the invasion of Ukraine. And Le Pen has quite successfully played down her past support for Russia and Putin. Uh, she did create a little bit of a scandal by saying that she could envisage being allies with Putin again after the war. And this was brought up on, on France Inter radio this morning. And she said, Oh, what I meant was we could be in the future allies with Russia again. Uh, but she, but I haven't heard her say a word against Putin, but it doesn't seem to be denting her support. You see, what the difference with Zamur was he really, he really came out strongly in support of Putin and the war and against the refugees. And, and Le Pen has just been very, has tiptoed around the whole issue. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Manuel, I invite everyone to both of you to answer each question. If you, if, if you have something to say on, on this one, our I mean, really, Lara has covered all, yeah, yeah. all the all the bases uh, there. Um, indeed, I, I, Zemmour suffered and took the hit for all the the pro Putin uh, anti NATO candidates. It, you know, it didn't dent anything for Mélenchon. He's like, he's got huge momentum at the moment, like plus four point five points, mm. I think, in the last month. Um, and and same same with Le Pen. Le Pen has been very 
cagey, careful, as Lara said, tiptoeing and being, being, um, yeah, a little bit shifty, but it worked for her. So, um, so yeah, it's uh, the, the, her electorate will keep support, and ultimately, her electorate, you know, is, and that is the difference with Zimo as well. Her electorate is very working class as well. Um, all they want is cost of living, purchasing power, etc. Whether she supports mm. Putin, how is she funded? They don't really care. <laughs> Excellent. I'll move on to, to a question that looking across Europe, we can see the kind of the recovery of, of the of the center left in a lot of places, uh, obviously in, in, in Iberia, in Germany, in the Nordics. And we've we've a question in, I'll, I'll, I'll put it to Emmanuel first. In fact, I'll, I'll group two questions together. The first of which is from Dr. Claire Loday at uh, Trinity College. Are you Claire? Nice to have you with us. The question is, how do you explain the collapse of the traditional left and right wing parties since 2017. Is there anything new since five years ago that either of you can, can shed light on regarding the, not just the collapse, but for me, what's curious is the failure, failure of the recovery on the center left, especially. And then a second question I'll group together is from, from Neil Brahanek, former Labour TD and former education minister. Good to have you with us. Neil, Neil asks to both speakers, any comment on the socialist failure to impact on this election? Related but separate. I'll give you the chance to answer first, Emmanuel. So um, I, what I can think of, um, certainly this collapse on the left started in 2017. They haven't recovered one bit. Uh, we might actually, one of the other big surprises that uh, might happen this Sunday is um, the communists potentially scoring slightly more than the socialists, which would be unheard of in the Fifth Republic. Um, so um, lack of unity on the left, it's so splintered. I mean, the number of uh, different parties on the left is, is just uh, astounding and they cannot agree. And there have been attempts, but they cannot agree on, uh, you know, a common manifesto, etc. which ultimately, if we mm -hmm. go back, that's what um, uh, Mitterrand did, right? Um, uh, with the Programme Commun, and that they don't have that and um which leads to a, a battle of egos which um is quite astounding um at the same time just specifically on Anne Hidalgo she was poorly selected in the process mm -hmm. I mean uh you know she seemed to have been selected by the party and then they went oh we'll do a primary to endorse it which which was really um, like putting things back to front and uh, obviously not being very uh, democratic. Um, but ultimately, I mean, it comes back to the lack of ideas. What have they brought to the debate that is really novel? Um, uh, how have they regenerated or modernized their their uh, their ideas? How the party is working as well is uh, particularly uh, questioning, and um, and that's uh, that's. That I think on the left is one of uh, the the or a few of the biggest issues. On the right, um, yes, I, I'm more surprised nearly on the right to see Les Républicains struggling so much. And you had, sorry, I never mentioned, I never answered your past question about Sarkozy. Um, Sarkozy didn't endorse Pécresse. And this has been a slow poison for her campaign, I think. And, you know, she was hoping to get the endorsement and it didn't come. And I think his advisors or his friends kept putting out all the nasty things he was saying in private about her uh, and kind of highlighting how he thought Macron was absolutely amazing, even better than he was, uh, you know. So um, Sarkozy built Le Les Républicains to his image uh, and managed to hold it together. Uh, this party doesn't, um, doesn't work anymore because ultimately Pécresse was um, chosen, but we know now that there were probably irregular irregularities in the way she was chosen. Ciotti that Lara mentioned is at the extreme right of this party and she had to hold the two sides together um, without, with, with very technical measures. She had no vision for, um, you know, um, for France from, uh, from her conservative uh, viewpoint um, and you mentioned in, in my question uh, or in one of the questions you asked me you mentioned that uh, Pécresse 
accused um, you know, Macron of stealing her ideas. But that is a huge endorsement for her voters to go and vote for Macron. So I think that was uh, a huge mistake. Um, there's, again, a, a lack of, um, of, uh, of vision on the right. Um, and, and that has been problematic, I think. Lara, anything left unsaid there? Uh, no, that's that's pretty good summary. I, I'd say yes, the fragmentation of the left is is a huge problem. We saw almost a replay of what happened in 2002 when Jospin, who should have been in the runoff and could quite possibly have been a, a good socialist president for France, lost just because of, I think there were five socialist candidates or, or shoot offs of, of social. And, and when uh, Christiane Taubira uh, stood, she, she eventually pulled out of the race. But when she decided to be a candidate, everyone said, you're, you're, you're destroying us, just like you did in 2002. I think that on both sides, that the real problem is a dearth of charismatic politicians. Um, the socialists have had no one who's, who's just who, you, who you'd want to vote for, uh, no one convincing at all. And in 2017, Benoit Hamon, who was their, their candidate, then I think he got 6% of the vote. And it looks like Annie Hidalgo will get two, two and a half percent, which is just, I mean, an absolute catastrophe for a once proud party. I mean, they had to sell their headquarters uh, at the Solferino headquarters, big historic building that was bought by Mitterrand. Um, Francois Hollande's presidency was pretty disastrous. Uh, and I think they've had a hard time li living that down. I mean, an exa a couple of examples to show the importance of having charismatic leaders Emmanuel mentioned that the, the Communist Party may surpass the Socialist um, on Sunday. And that is because the Communists have a guy called Fabien Roussel, who's, who's likable. Uh, and he's been one of the surprises of this campaign. And he will perform, you know, he's not going to make it to the runoff, but he will almost certainly perform better than Anne Hidalgo. Uh, and re regarding the Rep Les Républicains, uh, Edouard Philippe, who originally was a, a Juppéiste uh, from Les Républicains, uh, was incredibly popular as prime minister. And that's why Macron got rid of him. And he very loyally said, I will not stand against Emmanuel Macron. But he's sort of waiting in the wings. And I could see, a, I could imagine a rejuvenation of Les Républicains around the character of Edouard Philippe. That, that is not at all impossible. I think that, that Macron handled Nicolas Sarkozy very well because he knew, uh, there's this lovely expression in French, caresser dans le sens du poil, you know, like the, if, if you're, you're petting a cat or a dog or whatever. And uh, Macron flattered Sarkozy, he invited him and Carla Bruni to the Elysee for meals, he sought advice from him. And who knows, maybe, maybe there's some secret deal between them and Macron will appoint Sarkozy to some wonderful position. I, I don't know. But um, I, I think I, I sensed uh, a, a certain misogyny also in Sarkozy vis-a-vis -vis Valérie Becresse. I, I could be wrong about that, but um, you know, he feels that, that Les Républicains is his, it's his party. Um, I think he, he was very annoyed that he wasn't their candidate five years ago. And, and he, he just thinks Pécresse isn't good enough to, to lead his party. Um, so that, that, that's pretty much all I would have to say about the, the collapse. A, a quick query just on Anne Hidalgo, especially if we look at the past kind of five, six years of French politics, the rise of the Gilets jaunes, for example, there's this great sense of, you know, the peri-urban versus the urban. To, to what extent was is, is Hidalgo's problem that she's from Paris? If she was the mayor of Lille, would that make a big difference, do you think? Or are the socialists just at the, not at the races anyway? Well, one one hears that said. I don't know, Jacques Chirac was mayor of Paris and he mm -hmm. became president. I, I'm not sure that's really the reason. I mean, I live in Paris and frankly, I don't think she runs the city very well. Um, she's always doing all these foreign policy initiatives, but the, the streets are full of holes, you know? And, and I think people want, they want it that the city is dirty, um, you know, and, and she, the only thing she's good for is cyclist. And as a cyclist, I, I appreciate that. There are a lot of new bicycle lanes, which is great. And, and bicycle parking lots, you know, with those those bars where you, where you attach your bicycle. But aside from that, I, I can't, I really wouldn't have anything good to say about the way she's run the city. And I, I think there's a strong feeling that if, if she can't run the city properly, how is she going to run the country? 
I did actually notice that on a recent trip to Paris, what you say about cyclists. Manuel, before moving on to the we have a question from, from, from Alan Duke, so I want to get to, but do you want to, do you want to comment yeah, on the Just, analogy just a, a point. I do think it, it matters, though. Um, <laughs> I think it matters that she's from Paris. I think it matters, linked to what Lara just mentioned, that uh, she's not very charismatic. Because, yes, Jack Lerac was from Paris, but he was from Corrèze. You know, he was, mm. like, that was where he was from. Oh. And he was well known for being this charismatic guy who was really warm and who would shake your hands and who'd share beer with you. And, you know, he was well known for his appearances in Le Salon d'Agriculture, the farming kind of big show uh, that we have every year. Um, and uh, and Anne Hidalgo doesn't have this charisma. Um, and on top of that, yes, she's linked to Paris. She's seen as a Parisian and um, that doesn't work in. So I would say no, if it had, it, it would have been the same with like the mayor of Lille or et cetera, like a, a big city um, or mm -hmm. similar, uh, but certainly having no kind of regional routing like Corrèze or, you know, Limousin or whatever, um, mm. that, that matters, I think, yeah. And it, it's, it's an accusation um, uh, put against Macron as well, that, you know, he's, he's a, an elite uh, Parisian mm. uh, mm. Candidate. That's I was wondering the the kind of crowded field already had one of those kind of a Parisian elite. So I wondered if that played yes. into it. But okay, in the interest of time, because this is a, a tremendous conversation, but there's loads of questions. So I'm going to start putting them just to you individually, if that's okay. And I'll stick with you, uh, Manuel. And, the, and there's a question from Alan Dukes, who's former uh, finance minister and many other things, and also a dear IIA member. And Alan asks, how likely is it that left wing voters will vote Macron in the second round? There have been reports that some of them say that Le Pen cannot be worse than Macron. Yes, indeed. And this is why the gap is, is tightening. Um, I think that's that's the problem that Macron is facing. And this is why in his big rally there, he went on about um, the social side of his manifesto, because so far he'd been kind of, uh, to take Lara's expression, caressé dans le sens du poil, the right-wing voters. And there he really tried to focus on the, the left-wing voters. He needs the two legs to walk to uh, the second round um, and, and to win eventually. So um, he, he, he needs those uh, left-wing voters. I personally still think that there is uh, a glass ceiling for Marine Le Pen. I think, I, I believe, at the last, I believe for, for several uh, reasons as well, we have two weeks between the two rounds. Um, last year, not that I'm saying it's going to be a repeat, but obviously the, the debate, uh, the televised debate really mm -hmm. killed Marie Le Pen. I, she's not going to do, uh, hopefully, or nearly hopefully for her, I, it was uh, cringing, but she, she, she is much better prepared. But even economically there, there's, there's, um, there are huge questions about how um, uh, costed her, her, her program is. So uh, the two weeks there, uh, Macron is going to, um, to have a huge impact, I think. Uh, he's kind of had a, a slow campaign so far. Uh, so I think the, the left-wing voters will come to him a little bit more or as we get to the second round, but it won't be a gap like Laha mentioned between 66 and 33. It won't be that gap this time uh, between Macron and Le Pen. That's my prediction, but don't hold me to it. <laughs> Most interesting. A quick change of gear and to you, Lara, we have a question from Derry Fitzgerald, Brigadier General, retired of the Irish Defence Forces. How are you doing, Derry? Question for Lara. Has US politics and European security impacted the debates to any extent? Um, a Republican president and a return of the US first policy could push for a reduction of US NATO involvement in Europe. Sorry, I'll just, I'll just say that again. Um, has US politics and European security impacted the debates? Let's leave it at that. Uh, not really. I mean, five years ago, Marine Le Pen was um, pro-Trump and she, she and, and actually this time Zemmour liked to portray himself as, as the the French Trump, um, mm -hmm. but I haven't really heard any mention of US policy and, and European security. I, I don't think it's a big issue here. I mean, the, Macron going and making speeches and saying uh, we must have European defense, that, that, would, that would please people, but no more than that. Um, it's not, I mean, Mélenchon possibly would have, would have 
Todd mm. would have, he would be the most likely to say anti-American things and, and to criticize. I mean, it's not like, let me put it this way, back in 2003, when you had the, the, the US laying waste to Iraq, I think there would have been a much stronger anti-American feeling. Uh, and there would have been fairly strong anti-Trump or pro-Trump feeling. Uh, Joe Biden does not inspire passions. Um, and he, the US is just kind of not, not a big deal in France at the moment. Kind of, kind of related to this, although a separate subject, obviously, we've already spoken about, about Putin, but the, the conflict in Ukraine, is, is there anything further you can say, Lara, about how it has intruded on the campaign? I'm thinking specifically about the president's involvement before the conflict official. Has that intruded much on the, on, on the discourse and public attitudes towards the president? I, th I think it's helped Macron a lot because mm -hmm. he's seen as capable of managing a crisis. He's seen as the chief of the armed forces. He's seen, you know, a lot of people here, like everywhere else in Europe, people are a bit worried. What if the war spreads? What if we get into World War III? Mm -hmm. And I think that they would have confidence in Macron uh, to lead them through that. And I'm not so sure they'd have confidence in anyone else to do so. So it, the, the war has definitely helped Macron. And in a way, the fact that the, the campaign has been so subdued and low key and, and almost uh, inaudible, invisible, has also helped Macron because he's the incumbent and people know him and he has that familiarity which the others have to fight to, to win and, and so on. So it, it, that is how it has impacted the campaign. It's always like a bit of an auction here, moving between different topics. So I'm going to shift gear again and put a question to you, Emmanuel, if I may. Uh, there's a question here from uh, Don Lobrolochon, an, I, an IIEA member. Question goes, given that many countries in Europe already have coalition governments, in fact, I think all bar maybe two, Portugal and Malta, I think, why do you, why do you say it is problematic? So it's a, a challenging question, but a fair one, because surely problematic is the antithesis of a strong man autocratic government. Uh, which lack checks and balances to limit the scope for public and private excesses. So why do you think it's problematic, Manuel? Oh, it's pro problematic in France, <laughs> in the French system. Um, you know, as Lara pointed out, the, the president is a monarch. The president wants a an overall majority, a, 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 an as homogeneous majority as possible. So uh, what uh, what the president doesn't want is certainly a, a mix and match of, we've had coalition governments in the past between the, the green, the socialist, the communists coming together and et cetera. So we've, we, and we've survived, so it, it, it was okay. Um, but, um, you know, if uh, Macron had, or, or Marine Le Pen, let's say Marine Le Pen is elected and she has to negotiate a coalition government between you know um some some center right uh conservative um uh voters the the Ciotti type voters in in la republica and her own camp plus some zemmour maybe if he gets a few mps uh elected um it, it, she will just have to water down what um she she wants to do uh, yeah. uh, on the domestic um scene and at the same time uh several kind of issues are uh, dealt with at European level in uh, different councils and um, and that comes from the the national government as well you know it's the the minister for agriculture uh, that goes uh, in the, the council for agriculture so um, so Marine Le Pen would have to compose basically and and it would be the same for for Macron. Lara mentioned that Fr France the French president is a monarch it's exactly that and Macron has behaved like a monarch uh, despite what he argued he would do right in 2017 he already promised he would have a, a constitutional reform which we haven't seen um so um so that's what every monarch wants uh, a very homogeneous uh so problematic i meant through the eyes of the present i don't find it problematic i just mean the, the president will find it uh more difficult to maneuver than uh, a government and a, a national assembly that just rubber a national assembly that just rubber stamps what the government uh puts before it very very clear analysis i think we just have time i'm going to put one question to lara and then a short one to both of you and again thanks very much for, for taking the time to be with us you know you're very busy there's a question from anthony brogan freelance journalist, and I have to read it because uh, you'll understand why. The question goes, what are the speaker's views, and I'll put this to you, Lara, on President Macron's foreign policy and climate diplomacy? 
And how would a change in the Palace of Versailles affect these matters going forward? We probably mean the Elysee Palace, but it's a nice slip of the tongue. We're talking about Macron being virtually a monarch. So foreign policy and, and climate diplomacy. Do you have a view, Lara? Uh, yeah, but my personal view is that um, I think his foreign policy overall is, is quite well, no, actually, I take that back. <laughs> I was going to say I approve. He he loves foreign policy. He's he he's like the the super diplomat. And poor Jean Yves Le Drian, his foreign minister, barely gets a good a look in. Uh, Jean Yves Le Drian gets to do all the sort of leftovers, and and Macron loves the big summit and you know being on the world stage and so on. Um, he's quite good at it in, in, in as much as he, he's engaged and he's got everyone on the telephone all the time and he's constantly fielding ideas and so on. Personally, I found it very hard to take when it, in the first year of his presidency, he was a very, very chummy, you know, hugging, kissing kind of with people like Donald Trump and Benjamin Netanyahu uh, and Putin at some stages as well. Uh, I wouldn't like, I, I think he overdoes it sometimes. Uh, on the other hand, I think I, I would approve very much of his fervor for the European Union. Um, he, he is an, a very convinced European. Uh, he's been, I think that uh, to a certain extent, Ursula von der Leyen and Charles Michel or they're certainly his allies. I don't. I, I think he was quite instrumental in getting them uh, mm. chosen. And, and I would. I would approve. I think he's done a lot for Europe. He really has. Climate policy. I have sort of mixed feelings. Um, his his actual record on climate. He's he's talked a lot, but I think he hasn't really done that much. I'm I'm kind of really. He's he's placing all of the investment now in nuclear power. And Le Pen also says is very gung ho on nuclear power. And and again, just personally, I have serious reservations about nuclear power. I think that, uh, you know, we have Fukushima and Chernobyl and, and Three Mile Island. We've had all these past examples. And um, I'd rather turn down the thermostat uh, than, than, than take the risk personally. And, and I don't, and he's, he's kind of using France's nuclear power program, which is it's more than 70% of their energy. And they're very fortunate because they're not reliant on, on Russian gas the way uh, Germany is. Uh, but he's using that as a sort of alibi. It's like, look, we're fighting climate change because we're, we have nuclear power. Um, it's not quite good enough for me. Thank you, Lara. Just in the, in the interest of time, I'm actually going to leave that as the last question. But Sorry, I'm going to ask you, Manuel, because I, I saw you actively listening as you were throughout, but specifically there when Lara was talking about climate and nuclear. Do you want to make a comment, Manuel? And then we'll no, I just it. wanted to say that I forgot to mention something in my in my remarks. But uh, what Lara just said, in a post Merkel era. Macron is really setting himself up to be the new leader of the European Union. That's his legacy. That's what he wants it to be. And uh, when you look at his program, I did say in his manifesto, he doesn't mention Europe much and etc. But actually, if you go back to the La Sorbonne speech he delivered in September 2017, you have all of what he wants to do for, you know, for the next five years there. And it's all there. And, uh, and yes, he wants to be the new leader of the European Union. And that's where, yes. as Lara mentioned, yeah, it's his legacy. That's, that's how he wants to be remembered, a really true, dedicated European. And can I just say, I will be looking at if he wins, whether he comes out, wherever he'll locate his victory stage, on the European anthem, because that really yeah. moved me in 2017. I don't know whether he'll do the same this year. And a tiny follow up question, right? Just to just to clarify what you're saying, Manuel, in terms of, um, you know, his, his European ambitions, is that leading from the European Council as the president? Or do you actually envisage him stepping away into into Brussels to try to obtain one of the top jobs as some people have discussed? As difficult as it would be for a character like Macron, but what are his what are his ambitions in that respect? No, no, for now, I think it's leading from the European Council. I think he's preparing the 2024 20, uh, elections. He's thinking transnational lists. He's thinking all of this. He's got his troops in renew now, and he's going to push that as much as possible. And he wants the next generation, next um, generation EU yeah, package to, of co collectivization of debt and etc. to be a model for uh, the, the Economic Monetary Union uh, and, and other uh, programs that the EU would develop. 
Anya Fionn, Quinlevin and Larmalo, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for taking the time and for the, the, the clear and, and thoughtful analysis. It's always a real pleasure. I'd like to thank on our side as well, Alex Conway, for pulling the event together from the research room. Uh, wishing you all the best. Thank you very much for your time. And I guess we may regroup in future to discuss the outcome of the French presidential elections if, if we have the time. So thank you, everybody, and have a good afternoon. Thank you.